This is a reading of Out of the Dust, Winter 1935, Part 2. The President's Ball. All across the land, couples dancing arm in arm, hand in hand, at the birthday ball. My father puts on his best overalls. I wear my Sunday dress, the one with the white collar and we walk to town to the Legion Hall and join the dance, our feet flying, me and my father, on the wood floor whirling to Arlie Wanderdale and the Black Mesa boys. Till 10, when Arlie stands up from the piano to announce we raised $33 for infantile paralysis, a little better than last year. And I remember last year, when mom was alive and we were crazy excited about the baby coming. And I played at the same party for Franklin D. Roosevelt and Joyce City in Arley. Tonight for a little while, in the bright hall, folks were almost free, almost free of dust, almost free of debt, almost free of fields of withered wheat. Most of the night, I think I smiled and twice my father laughed, imagine, 1935. Lunch. No one's going hungry at school today. The government sent canned meat, rice, potatoes. The bakery sent loaves of bread, and Scotty Moore, George Nall, and Willie Harkins brought in milk, fresh creamy milk, straight from their farms, real lunch, and then stomachs full and feeling fine for classes in the afternoon. The little ones drank themselves into white mustaches. They ate and ate until pushing back from their desks, their stomachs round, they swore they'd never eat again. The older girls, Elizabeth and Lorraine, helped Miss Friedland cook. And Hillary and I, we served and washed, our ears ringing with the sound of satisfied children. February 1935. Guests. In our classroom this morning, we came in to find a family no one knew. They were shy, a little frightened, embarrassed. A man and his wife pretty far along with a baby coming. A baby coming. Two little kids and a grandma. They moved into our classroom during the night. An iron bed and some pasteboard boxes. That's all they had. They cleaned the room first and arranged it, making a private place for themselves. I'm on the look for a job, the man said. The dust blew so mean last night. I thought to shelter my family here a while. The two little kids turned their big eyes from Miss Freeland back to their father. I can't have my wife sleeping in the cold truck, not now, not with the baby coming so soon. Miss Freeland said they could stay as long as they wanted. February, 1935. Family school. Every day we bring fixings for soup and put a big pot on to simmer. We share it at lunch with our guests, the family of migrants who moved out from dust and depression and moved into our classroom. We are careful to take only so much to eat, making sure there's enough soup left in the pot for their supper. Some of us bring in toys and clothes for the children I found a few things of my brothers and brought them to school. Little feed sack nighties, so small, so full of hope. Franklin never wore a one of the nighties mom made him, except the one we buried him in. The man Buddy Williams helps out around the school, fixing windows and doors, and the bad spot on the steps, cleaning up the schoolyard so it never looked so good. The grandma takes care of the children, bringing them out when the dust isn't blowing, letting them chase tumbleweeds across the field, behind the school, 
but when the dust blows, the family sits in their little apartment inside our classroom, studying Miss Freeland's lessons right alongside us. February, 1935. Birth. <clears throat> One morning when I arrive at school, Miss Freeland says to keep the kids out, that the baby is coming and no one can enter the building until the birthing is done. I think about Ma and how that birth went. I keep the kids out and listen behind me, praying for the sound of a baby crying into the, this world and not the silence my brother brought with him. And then the cry comes and I have to go away for a little while just to walk off the feelings. Miss Freeland rings the bell to call us in, but I'm not ready to come back yet. When I do come, I study how fine that baby girl is, how perfect, and that she is wearing a feed sack nightgown that was my brother's, February, 1935. Time to go. They left a couple weeks after the baby came, all of them crammed inside that rusty old truck. I ran a half mile in the dust to catch them. I didn't want to let that baby go. Wait for me, I cried, choking in the cloud that rose behind them, but they didn't hear me. They were heading west and no one was looking back. February, 1935. Something Sweet from Moonshine. Ashby Derwin and his pal Rush had themselves a fine operation on the Cimarron River where the water still runs a little. <clears throat> Though the fish are mostly dead from the dust floating on the surface, Ashby and Rush were cooking up moonshine in their giant metal still on the bank when Sheriff Robertson caught them. He found, two, he found jugs of finished whiskey and barrels and barrels of mash. He found two sacks of rye. He found sugar and he found sugar. 1,000 pounds of sugar. The government men took Ashby and Rush off to Enid for breaking the law. But Sheriff Robertson stayed behind, took apart the still, washed away the whiskey and the mash, and thought about that sugar. All that sugar, one half ton of sugar, Sheriff decided some should find its way into the mouth of us kids. Bake for them, Miss Freeland, he said. Bake them cakes and cookies and pies. Cook them custard and cobbler and crisp. Make them candy and taffy and an apple pen, pen dowdy. Apple pen dowdy. These kids, Sheriff Robinson said, ought to have something sweet to wash down their dusty milk. And so we did. February, 1935. Dreams. Each day after class lets out, each morning before it begins, I sit at the school piano and make my hands work. In spite of the pain, in spite of the stiffness and scars, I make my hand play piano. I have practiced my best piece over and over till my arms throb. Because Thursday night, the Palace Theater is having a contest. Any man, woman, or child who sings, dances, reads, or plays worth a lick can climb onto that stage. Just register by 4 p.m. and give them a taste of what you can do and you're in, performing for the crowd, warming up the audience for the Hazel Heard players. I figured if I practice enough, I won't shame myself. And I'm sure, and we sure could use the extra cash if I won. $3 first prize, $2 second, $1 third. But I don't know if I could win anything, not anymore. It's the playing I want most, 
the proving I can still do it. Without Arlie making excuses, I have hunger for more than food. I have hunger bigger than Joyce City. I want tongues to tie and eyes to shine at me like they do at Mad Dog Craddock. Of course, they never will. Not with my hands all scarred up, looking like the earth itself, all parched and rough and cracking. But if I play right enough, maybe they'll see past my hands. Maybe they could feel at ease with me again. And maybe then I could feel at ease with myself. February, 1935. The competition. I suppose everyone enjoys city and beyond. All the way to Felt and Keys and even Guyman came to watch the talent show at the palace Thursday night. Backstage, there were 17 amateur acts, our wild hearts pounding, our lips sticking to our teeth. Our urge to empty ourselves top and bottom made a sorry sight in the front of the famous Hazel Heard players. But they were kind to us, helped us with our makeup and our hair, showed us where to stand, how to bow, and the quickest route to the toilet. The audience hummed on the other side of the closed curtain. Ivy Huxford kept peeking out and giving reports of who was there and how she never saw so many seats filled in the palace and that she didn't think they could squeeze a rattlesnake into the back even if he paid full price. The place was so packed. My father told me he'd come once chores were done. I guess he did. The Grover boys let us off. They worked a charm, baby on the sax, Jake on the banjo, and Ben on the clarinet. The Baker family followed, playing just like they do at home every night after dinner. They didn't look nervous at all. The top dancers, they rattled the teeth in their jaws and the eyeballs in their skulls, their feet flying, their arms swinging, their mouths gaping. Then Sonny Lee Hallam tumbled and leapt onto the stage, the sweat flying off her, spotting the palace floor. Marsh Walton struggled out, his accordion leading the way. George and Agnes Harkins ran their fingers over the strings of their harps, made you want to look up to the heavens for angels, but only scenery and lights and ropes and sandbags hung over their heads. And then there was me on the piano. I went on somewhere near the back side of middle getting more and more jittery with each act till mine came. I played Bye Bye Blackbird my own way, messing with the tempo. And the first part sounded like I just, I used just my elbows, but the middle sounded good. And the end, I forgot I was even playing in the front of the packed palace theater. I dropped right inside the music and didn't feel anything. Till after when the clapping started and that's when I noticed my hands hurting straight up to my shoulders, but the applause made me forget the pain. The audience roared when I finished. They came to their feet. I got third prize, $1, while Mad Dog Craddock singing one second and Ben Grover and his crazy clarinet took first. The tap dancers pouted to their mirrors, peeling off their makeup and their smiles. Bertie Jasper claimed it was all my fault she didn't win, that the judges were just being nice to a cripple. But the harp and Harkins were kind and the hazel her players wrapped their long arms around me and said I was swell. And in the sweaty, dim chaos backstage, I ignored the pain running up and down my arms. I felt like I was part of something grand. 
but they had to give my ribbon and my dollar to my father because I couldn't hold anything in my hands. February 1935. The piano player. Arlie says, we're doing a show at the school in a week, Billy Joe, come play with us. If I asked my father, he'd say yes, it's okay with him if I want to play. He didn't know, he didn't even know I was at the piano again till the other night. He's making some kind of effort to get on better with me now, since I did him proud at the palace. But I say no, it's too soon after the contest. It still hurts too much. Arlie doesn't understand. Just practice more, he says. You'll get it back. You could travel with us again this summer if you'd like. I don't say. It hurts like the parched earth with each note. I don't say. One chord and my hands scream with pain for days. I don't show him the swelling or my tears. I tell him, I'll try. At home, I sit at Ma's piano. I don't touch the keys. I don't know why. I play stormy weather in my mind, following the phrases in my imagination, saving strength, so that when I sit down at a piano that is not Ma's, when everyone crowds into the school for Arlie's show, no one could say that Billy Joel Kelby plays like a cripple. March, 1935. No good. I did play like a cripple at Arlie's show. Not that Arlie would ever say it, but my hands are no good anymore. My playing's no good. Arlie understands, I think. He won't ask again. March, 1935. snow. I had to check yesterday morning to make sure that was snow on the ground, not dust. But you can't make a dust ball packed together and slam against the side of the barn and echo across the field. So I know it was snow. March 1935. Night school. My father thought maybe he ought to go to night school. So if the farm failed, there'd be prospects to fall back on. He's starting to sound like Ma. The farm won't fail, I tell him, as long as we get some good rain. I'm starting to sound like him. It's mostly ladies in those classes, he says. They take bookkeeping and civics and something called business English. I can't imagine him taking any of those things. But maybe he doesn't care so much about the classes. Maybe he's thinking more about the company of ladies. I'll bet none of the ladies mind spending time with my father. He's still good looking with his strong black back and his blonde red hair and his high cheeks rugged with wind. I shouldn't mind either, it's dinner. I don't have to come up with cause the ladies bring chicken and biscuits for him. I'm glad to get out of cooking. Sometimes with my hands, it's hard to keep the fire, wash the pans, hold the knife and spread a little butter. So I don't mind his spending time with all those biddies. I turn my back on him as he goes and settle myself in the parlor and touch Ma's piano. My fingers leave sighs in the dust. March, 1935. Dust pneumonia. Two Fridays ago, Peter Garman drove in with a truck full of produce. He joked with Caleb Hardley, Mr. Hardley's son, while they unloaded eggs and cream down at the store. Pete Guyman teased Caleb Hardley about the Wildcats losing to Hooker. 
Caleb hardly teased Pete Guyman about his wheezy truck sucking in dust. Last Friday, Pete Guyman took ill with dust pneumonia. Nobody knew how to keep that produce truck on the road. It sat filled with turkeys and heavy hens waiting for delivery. It sat out in front of Pete's drafty shack and still sits there, the cream curdling and the apples, apples going soft. Because a couple of hours ago, Pete Garman died. Mr. Hardley was already on the phone to a new produce supplier before evening. He had people in his store and no food to sell them. His boy Caleb slammed the basketball against the side of the house until Caleb's ma yelled at him, yelled for him to quit. And late that night, a truck rattled up to the store with colored springs, dozens of hens, filthy eggs, and a driver with no interest whatsoever in young Caleb Hardley or his precious wildcats. March 1935. Dust storm. I never would have gone to see the show if I would have known a storm like this would come. I didn't know when going in, but coming out, a darker night I'd never seen. I bumped into a box beside the palace door and scraped my shins, then tripped on something in my path. I don't know what. I walked into a phone pole and bruised my cheek. The first car that I met was sideways in the road. Bowed down, my eyes near shut, trying to keep the dust out. I saw his headlights just before I reached them. The driver called over to me. I felt my way, following his voice. He asked me how I kept the road. I feel it with my feet, I shouted over the roaring wind. I walked along the edge, one foot on the road, one on the shoulder, and desperate to get home. He straightened out his car and straddled tires on the road and off and slowly pulled away. I kept along, I know that there were others on the road. From time to time, I'd hear someone cry out. Their voices rose like ghosts on the howling wind. No one could see. I stopped at neighbors just to catch my breath and made my way from town out to our farm. Everyone said to stay but I guessed my father would come out to find me if I didn't show and get myself get and get himself lost in the raging dust and maybe die. And I didn't want that burden on my soul. Brown earth rained down from sky. I could not catch my breath the way the dust pressed on my chest and wouldn't stop. The dirt blew down so thick it scratched my eyes and stung my tender skin. It plugged my nose and filled the inside of my mouth. No matter how hard I pressed my lips together, the dust made muddy tracks across my tongue. I kept on spitting out mud, covering my mouth, clamping my nose, the dust stinging the raw and open stripes of my skull of scarring on my hands. After some three hours, I made it home. Inside, I found my father's note that said he'd gone to find me and if I should get home to just stay put. I hollered out the front door and the back. He didn't hear. I didn't think he would. The wind took my voice and busted it into a thousand pieces. So small the sound blew out over Ma and Franklin's grave thinner than a sigh. I waited for my father through the night, coughing up dust, cleaning dust out of my ears, rinsing my mouth, blowing mud out of my nose. Joe De La Flor stopped by around four to tell me they had found one boy tangled in a barbed wire fence, another smothered in a drift of dust. 
After Joe left, I thought of the famous Lindberghs and how their baby was killed and never came back to them. I wondered if my father would come back. He blew in around 6 a.m. It hurt, the sigh of him, the sight of him, brown with dirt. His eyes were red as raw meat. His feet bruised from walking in worn shoes, stepping where he couldn't see, on things that bit and cut into his flesh. I tried to scare up something we could eat, but I couldn't keep the table clear of dust. Everything I set down for our breakfast was covered before we took a bite. And so we chewed the grit and swallowed, and I thought of the cattle dead from the mud in their lungs, and I thought of the tractor buried up to the steering wheel, and Pete Guyman. I couldn't even recognize the man sitting across from me sagging in his chair, his red hair gray and stiff with dust, his face deep lines of dust, his teeth streaked brown with dust. I turned the plates and glasses upside down, crawled into bed and slept. March 1935. Broken promise. It rained a little everywhere, but here. March 1935. Motherless. If Ma could put her arm across my shoulder sometime or stroke back my hair or sing me to sleep, making the soft sounds, the reassuring noises, that no matter how brittle and sharp life seemed, no matter how brittle and sharp she seemed, she was still my ma who loved me. Then I think I wouldn't be so eager to go. March, 1935. Following in his steps. Hayden Parley Nye's wife, Fonda, died today, two months after she lost her man. The cause of death was dust pneumonia, but I think she couldn't go on without Hayden. When Ma died, I didn't want to go on either. I don't know. I don't feel the same now, not exactly. Now that I see that one day comes after another and that you get through them one measure at a time. But I'd like to go, not like Fond and I. I don't want to die. I just want to go away out of the dust, March 1935.